Please welcome to the stage Atlantic Live Senior Vice President and General Manager, Candace Montgomery. Hello everyone and welcome to the Atlantic's In Pursuit of Happiness. We are excited to kick off our final day of programming. If you missed any, any of yesterday's engaging main stage conversations, you can catch them on demand via the Atlantic's YouTube channel. Yesterday, we explored the signs of happiness and applying the practices of happiness to our lives. Today, we'll examine how to foster deep connections with others and sharing joy. Along the way, you'll participate in self-reflection exercises and connect with other attendees. Before we get started, we want to recognize our underwriters, the John Templeton Foundation and Tito's Handmade Vodka for supporting the Atlantic's journalism. Also, we want to encourage you to be a part of the conversation online. When posting to social, please use hashtag Atlantic Happiness. And for our virtual audience, you can submit questions via the Q&A tab on your screens. Now let's start the day with a series of conversations and presentations focused on mindfulness and self-reflection. For our final Ideas Out Loud presentation, please welcome Gretchen Rubin, author and podcast host of Happier with Gretchen Rubin, to discuss the key to happiness is knowing yourself. Hello, I'm so happy to be here in person. Um, it's so wonderful to be in this beautiful place with a bunch of people. Um, I am a writer who studies happiness and human nature, and people will often come to me and say, be if here in person, one thing, um, it's so wonderful to, to be happiness. in this beautiful place. For and a bunch it turns of out there's a couple different um, ways. I am a writer who studies happiness depending and human on nature, what perspective and people will uh, often you take come on. to me and, and say, one answer, be here in person, person one thing, um, is it's so wonderful to be in this beautiful place. And it turns out there's a couple different ways that to be happy, we need to have deep, intimate bonds. We need to feel like we belong. We need to be able to get support, and just as important for happiness, we need to be able to give support. But another answer is self-knowledge, because we can build a happy life only on the foundation of our own nature, our own interests, our own values. In fact, these answers are intertwined because it's when we know ourselves that we're most able to connect deeply and harmoniously with other people. But it is so easy to assume that the way we see the world is the way that everybody else sees the world and vice versa. There's a paradox. We're more alike than we think, but the differences are very important. Or to put it another way, you're unique just like everybody else. And it's when we understand that people are different. They see the world differently. They have different preferences. They need to use different strategies to get where they're going. That's when we can show more compassion for other people and for ourselves. Because if we don't recognize the fact that people see things differently, it's very easy to become angry, resentful, puzzled, hurt when they don't do something the way that we would do it. Or we can become frustrated and discouraged with ourselves because we can't do the things the way other people can do them. And so I'm going to talk about some very obvious common examples of where this crops up. And first is morning people and night people. OK. Morning people and night people have very different energy levels when they are at their most productive, creative, and energetic throughout the day. As a morning person, I used to think that everybody could be a morning person if they just went to bed on time. But it is actually largely a function of genetics and age. How many people here would say they are basically a morning person? OK, well, how many people would say they're night people? OK. Um, we can use this knowledge. So a friend of mine came to me and she said, I'm furious with my husband. Every morning, I'm running around getting our two little kids ready for school. He staggers out of the bedroom. He is useless. I end up doing everything every morning all by myself. But I know her husband. I said, hey. He's a night person. He's useless to you. He's useless to everyone. Why don't you let him sleep, you do the mornings, and let him do bedtime by himself when you're tired? So they worked it out. Another difference. 
simplicity lovers and abundance lovers. So simplicity lovers are people who love space, empty surfaces, not that much on the shelves. And abundance lovers love profusion and choice and buzz and collections and piles, a lot going on. How many people here would say they're basically a simplicity lover? My hand is up, yeah. How many people would say they're an abundance lover? And that's fine. Unless you have a boss who says, a cluttered desk means a cluttered mind and makes everyone embrace simplicity. Or you have a boss who said, oh, let's decorate for the holidays and drapes twinkle lights and garlands all over everything for two months. The question is, how can we use this knowledge of ourselves and others to create an environment where everybody feels comfortable? And then also accountability. People respond differently to accountability. Some people need accountability, even to meet their expectations for themselves. If they want to exercise, they need to work out with a trainer or work with a friend who's going to be annoyed if they don't show up or raise money for a charity. Other people resist accountability. They don't want somebody looking over their shoulder or putting appointments in their calendar. They want to do their work in their own way, in their own time. And how many people here would say basically they need accountability? How many people would say they resist accountability? Okay, I've seen this crop up in my life as a writer. I have a, uh, a friend who is writing a book, and usually when you write nonfiction, uh, you write two chapters and sell it on that proposal, but he went ahead and wrote the whole book. And I said, well, why did you do that? And he said, I write a book because I felt like writing a book, but if I had an editor telling me I had to hand in a chapter at the end of the month, I wouldn't do it. Okay, but then I know two writers who meet on Zoom, mute themselves, and just sit there writing but they need to hold each other accountable, and that's what works for them. And the final observation I would make is, instead of spending our time arguing about, well, I'm right, you're wrong, or worrying, ooh, you're right, I'm wrong, or arguing about what is the best way, or what is the right way, we should think about knowing ourselves and knowing others so that we can create an environment where everyone can thrive. So thank you. <laughs> Joining Gretchen Rubin to further the conversation, please welcome Atlantic staff writer Olga Hazan. Hey! Hey! Okay, Gretchen, thanks so much for that great introduction to this conversation. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to uh, point out that we'll be taking audience questions at the end, so be thinking of your questions. Um, you know, this seems a little counterintuitive to me. Like, I, how does exactly how does self knowledge lead to happiness if you you know knowing yourself doesn't necessarily change anything about you know your external circumstances? Well, I think. One of the problems comes is that when we don't know ourselves, we, we try things that don't work for us, or we try to you know, cram ourselves into some Procrustean bed of what other people tell us will work. And when we think about you know, what's true for us, we can set things up to suit ourselves. Just like you know, morning people and night people. People would say, oh, I know if it's really important to me, I should get up and do it at 7 AM, or I know I'm supposed to exercise first thing in the morning. You know, and it's just like, well, have you met yourself? Because that's not gonna work for you if you're a night person. And so I think it can really lower people's frustration and discouragement with themselves because they can try to make changes that will suit them instead of um, just sort of like some fantasy self or what people say is sort of the, the best way to do it. What are some ways to actually get to know yourself better? I mean, I think most of us think like, oh yeah, I have a sense of, you know, I, I tend to, I'm not a morning person, um, right. but so I kind of know that about myself, so I may not need to take a quiz for that, but there are probably some things that I could know better about myself. Well, this is one of the most puzzling things because you think, well, how hard can it be to know myself? I hang out with myself all day long, right? What could be more obvious? But in fact, I think it's very hard for us to know ourselves. I think part of it is that we have, we have what we wish we were, or what we assume we are, or what other people expect from us, or what we wish we were. And so um, one, I'm a big fan of asking yourself questions, because I think sometimes you can a question will sort of indirectly show an aspect of your nature that maybe you wouldn't have acknowledged. So some questions that I think are really helpful are, um, uh, what do you lie about? 
Because when you lie about something, it's often because your, your, your actions don't match your values. Like a friend of mine was like, oh, I ride my bike to work every day. But he totally did not, right? And that's fine. Like, you don't have to ride your, work, your bike to work every day. But if that's your value, like he wasn't admitting that he wasn't living up to his value. Another one that I think is interesting is whom do you envy? Envy is a very negative emotion. We often want to deny that we're feeling envy. But it's really helpful because it means somebody has something that you don't want. So if you are envious because, um, you know, well, in the before times, I remember somebody was really, really envious of a coworker who did a lot of traveling. And she was, she was also kind of resentful. Um, so I was like, well, so then she could figure out, well, from this envy, I see that maybe that's something I want for myself. Other questions are things like, what are you grateful for, or who are you grateful for now that you weren't grateful for at the time? That shows you something about yourself. What did you do for fun when you were 10 years old? That's often something you would enjoy as an adult. So a lot of times, like I think a question can help us get insight into these key areas. And is that like codified in some sort of quiz that people can take, or should they, should they just be taking notes right now? <laughs> Uh, well, then I have a quiz. I have my four tendencies quiz. Take my four tendencies quiz. But that's, that's, that's one aspect of yourself. Yes, how you respond to expectations. And how does understanding ourselves actually help us understand other people, too? Well, I think that there is... An, I, I, it, it may be even impossible to resist it to some degree, an assumption that other people see the world the way we do. You just can't help it. Um, you don't, and I think that it's only by constant self-reflection and really looking to see how people might be doing something different to help you um, to get, gain that insight. Um, because it just, it just, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think of, okay, a great place to see this in action is if you go to an office and you go to the kitchen. This is my favorite thing to do. I will make a beeline to any kitchen and read the signs. <laughs> Right, And you will see, how do people feel about the mugs in the dishwasher? And you will see that there are four entire philosophies of how you should think about the mugs going into the dishwasher. And they are all principled, and they are all well articulated, and they're completely inconsistent. And everyone is baffled by how these people who seem perfectly nice are like these incredibly inconsiderate coworkers. And it's like, because they all just see it a different way. And once you realize that, you're like, okay, it's not that I'm right and you're wrong. It's just, you think this, I think that. So let's figure out a solution. What's the best way to like explain your self-knowledge to other people? Because oh, for, like the morning tricky. person, night person thing is a really good example. Cause like you, you know, I, you have to show up for work at a certain time or, you know, you, right. you people have certain expectations of you at certain times a day. Um, what's the best way to say, like, actually, you know, I really thought about this and I, I really am not a morning person, so I would love to do this at a different time in a way that feels um, not so self-centered? Well, I think that one of the things about seeing that it's just, a, it's just an, an aspect where people might differ, it allows you to talk about it in a way that's not like, well, you're wrong or everything needs to change. It's more like, well, this is the way I am and so can we, can we work it out in a better way? Like with accountability, for instance, this is something where people are very different. And so like a friend of mine said that whenever she interviewed for a job, she's somebody who really, really needs accountability. She said, I need a tough boss. I do my best work with a tough, demanding boss. I'm not, and then other people are like, hey, I don't want to be micromanaged. I want to be told like, hey, go do it. You, you know, come back in a month. Let me know if you have any, if you hit any roadblocks. So part of it is knowing, and then you can say to somebody, um, I want accountability. I want to have check-ins. And then, you know, and if, if you're the manager or the boss, you have to be willing to understand that for some people, they might need a different setup than, than other people. I mean, I think the more that you can just sort of articulate it, the, the better able you are to try. We can't always get it, things to be set up the way we want, but, um, but when we can explain it, it just is sort of like, this, what are you going to do? People are different. Um, it kind of takes the sting out of it. I'm wondering how um, self-knowledge played into your own personal career journey? Because you actually were an attorney before you became a writer. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering how that, you know, whether you understood something about yourself that helped you make that transition or how that transition helped you understand yourself better. 
Both, probably. But there was a moment, yes, I was clerking for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, and that's when I realized that I actually wanted to be a writer. Um, and there was a moment where I had I'd had an idea. It had occurred to me that I could turn it into a book. I started kind of trying to write this book. And then it, it was sort of like, okay, am I going to try to get another job? Like, And then I realized that for me that I, I, w I thought... I would rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer at this point. And so I should try to succeed as a writer. Um, but that was a very important thing for me to realize that, that that was really the path. And I had to just sort of like try to do it, try for it. Um, in, in my article about personality change, I wrote about how people with really stressful jobs actually become more neurotic yes. over time. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering whether, you know, transitioning to a job that you liked better, you know, as a writer, whether that led to any changes in your personality or in your thought patterns, you know. Well, see, I think this is a really interesting question. When, when I read your piece, I read that part like a couple times to sort of think it through. It was so thought provoking. Because what I found, so I wrote this book, The Happiness Project. And I mean, I'm constantly doing like everything I can possibly think of to make myself happier. Like I just, I'm my own guinea pig. I can't resist any exercise. Um, but you know, if you said to me, are you fundamentally different? Like if I'm lying in bed trying to fall asleep at night or I'm like on the subway staring into space, I think I'm still the same person. You know, I, I think I'm still a seven on the one to 10 scale. I'm kind of, the, but the difference is that my life is so much happier. My experiences are so much happier. I have so much more like fun and friends and things that I'm enthusiastic about and so much less things that are, they made me bored or guilty or angry because of changes that I made. And I think a, a, a job, I mean, we've all had experiences where you, for one reason or another, a job is really, or a situation is really dreadful. And then you quit or you move or do whatever. And then overnight, your experience of your life is so different. So I don't even think that it's so much that you're different, but the, but the experience of your life is so different. Um, and certainly maybe some of your impulses change if you're in like a high treachery place um, might take you a while to get back to yourself. I was wondering what the typical barriers are to understanding yourself. I think a lot of people might say like, yeah, I should understand myself better, but I don't know, is it kind of, I, th I think it could also be a little bit scary, you know, to kind of really dig in and think about what do I really want, you know, um, yeah. how am I different from other people, you know? Well, Yes, and, and, and you also, you don't want to get into a situation where you just sort of hand wave everything and sort of say like, well, what are you going to do? I guess I'm just, you know, not this or not that. I'm not an athlete um, or I'm lazy. People can lock into these personalities. And the way that I, I, what I always remind myself is I want to accept myself and expect more from myself. So I want to embrace what's true for me and kind of the natural limitations of my nature. But then I also want to push against the sort of accidental, um, like, like the things where, and usually you can tell. People keep asking me for like a test. How can you tell when something is just, you know, Olga, you be you, and then we're just like, oh yeah, you really should push yourself and go outside the comfort zone. But really only you can know, only an individual can know. And like a great example for me is I'm a really fearful driver. My sister is also a very fearful driver. For whatever reason, I can drive, but I really, really don't like to drive. And several years ago, I was like, well, maybe I should just stop driving. And I was so excited by the prospect of that. And then I thought, because um, I live in New York City, I don't have to drive that much. And then I thought, no, this is something where I can expect this of myself, even though it's really, really unpleasant. Um, so, but I had to figure that out. And for someone else, they might have made a different judgment. Or things like, um, you know, I'm not going to expect myself to go bungee jumping. I'm like, that's just too outside my zone. Um, but for somebody else, that might be a great challenge. Uh, so I think it's, it's just constant self-reflection. You've, uh, you've written and you've talked about uh, journaling and the power of journaling. Um, and I'm wondering if journaling can play a role in getting to know ourselves better. Oh, 100%. I think that's one of the main, the main benefits of it. Again, like there are journals where they have questions that you reflect on. But even just writing things down, even if it's just one sentence a day, there's something about putting things on paper. It gives you that distance. You can look back on it. Um, though it's funny, um, 
people, I know many people who have kept journals for years, and they've made the same observation, which is you go back to your old journals and you, you see that you're having the same epiphany over and over and over. <laughs> like every five years, they're like, oh my gosh, now it's all clear to me. Um, so it is funny, but I think you, you can see yourself changing over time and remembering what an earlier stage of your life is. I do think, I mean, one of the things that like, see, feels very important to me just personally is I always want to feel connected to my past selves. Like, I want to have a feeling that I'm connected. So I take great pleasure in, like, I have a, fr I have a friend that I have known since kindergarten, and just the fact that this person is still in my life is so meaningful to me. It helps me feel like I'm connected to my own past, and I think nothing's better than a journal, you know, for helping you feel located in your own past. I was wondering if you could share some more specific examples of how self-knowledge can lead to, you know, better decision making or to, to better success. I mean, how can um, understanding yourself better kind of lead you to actually make better decisions? Okay, well, back to something that I, m I mentioned briefly is, okay, one thing, if you talk to adults, one thing that a lot of adults have problem, have difficulty with is having fun, right? For so long, they've been like having fun with, for the whole family, which I think Jerry Seinfeld said like does not exist, um, or, or whatever, or kind of, you know, accommodating or working it in that they kind of have lost touch with what's fun for them. So, but if you never are having fun, that's not a... That, that's a, good, that's a good place to work. If you're working on happiness, you want to have at least some parts of your life when you're having fun. And so by no, it, and it, but then you're like, well, where would I start? What would I do? One thing to do is, what did you do for fun when you were 10 years old? Did you go walking in the, par in the woods with your dog? Did you make arts and crafts? Did you, um, uh, you know, uh, dance around the room to music? When I was young, I, um, I for hours and hours and hours, I would copy my favorite quotations into blank books, and then I would, I would cut out images from magazines, and, and I would match the quotation to the image, and I would fill the, and so it kind of made this illustrated commonplace book. And I still have these, they're in my office right above my desk, they're all precious to me, and now I do the same thing as an adult. I have this moment of, new moment of happiness newsletter where I copy down a one of my favorite quotations, and so, and I get exactly the same pleasure out of doing it now that I had when I was like 10. Because, but it's just adapted to my adult life. And so a lot of times, if you don't know how to have fun now, by looking back and thinking, well, where was I then? What was true for me then? It can help you understand yourself better now. Um, another thing that, um, again, is true for me. I'm not saying this is true for everyone. Um, one of the ways we can get insight into ourselves, obviously, is by reading at, or watching TV or movies or whatever. That's how we, how we learn about ourselves, is seeing other people's examples. So I was reading Samuel Johnson, one of my favorite writers, and he's quoted, he made the observation, um, somebody offered him wine, and he said, uh, they said, oh, will you take a little wine? And he said, I can't take a little. Um, abstinence, is as e uh, abstinence is as easy to me as moderation would be difficult. And when I read that, I thought, that's me. I can have none, or I can have a lot. But I can't have a little bit. I can't have one thin mint cookie. I can't have half a dish of ice cream. It's like, I can have none, but if not, I'm going to go all the way. And once I understood that about myself, I saw a whole new solution to something that was like an annoyance in my life, which is that I have a really, really, really strong sweet tooth. And I just spent a lot of time managing my sweet tooth. I'd have something that I'd want more, two, three, it's my birthday, it's raining, it's, I've had such a hard day. Why not, you know, what's one more? You know, on and on and on. And I always marveled at those people who could have like, oh, I just keep a fine bar of chocolate in my desk drawer and I have one square every day and like that's enough and follow the 80-20 rule and all that. It just didn't work for me. And finally, but when I read Johnson, I was like, he's saying that for some people, it's easier to have none. And so I thought, well, why don't I try that? And I'm like, and I, I remember like the dawning excitement that I thought I could just give up sweets. And to me, that felt incredibly freeing and energizing. But people had, had always said things like, oh, don't eliminate one food group. Follow the 80-20 rule. You need to live a little. What's life without one brownie? And I re finally realized, that's true for you. That's not true for me. And my solution works really well for me. And so, you know, but it's not true for everyone. But it was by, looking, but it was by reading what Samuel Johnson said that really 
helped me to see myself more clearly. And once I saw myself more clearly, um, I was able to take action. But it also taught me not to march around and tell everybody else that they should do the same thing. Because some I'm an abstainer, but some people are moderators. And they do better when they have a little bit or when they have it sometimes. And that's what works for them. Yeah, I think I might be. I'm a moderator. Who's a moderator? Oh, um, the, <laughs> there you go. There um, you go. OK, do we have audience questions yet? Do people have questions? There's you get a gold star if you ask the first yeah. question, because nobody wants to be the first. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. Um, Olga, I actually read your article last night and found it delightful. Thank so you. this uh, story on changing your personality. So Gretchen, I'm wondering, can you change your nature? I'm an organized mess in my office, and I, I want to be the Marie Kondo office. <laughs> right. Or do I not? Do I not really want it? I just think I want it. Well, let me ask you, do you really want it? Do you think it's kind of a waste of time to do it if you're an organized mess? Uh, uh, yes, because I'm not choosing to change. Well, I, this is a surprisingly very complex question. But so one of the... <laughs> What I would say, um, and kind of the way I dodge the complexity of it in my own thinking, so because Olga was talking about, like, can you change your personality, right? Which is a really interesting question. And I was like, who cares about your personality? Who cares about your nature? In terms of, like, cleaning your office. If what you want to do is change, get a different result, you can just think about what is the behavior that you could do that would give you the result you want, whether or not you yourself change. And so if you're like, well, because maybe when you really think about how you feel about it, you're like, you know, everybody in my life is kind of telling me that I should get this under control, but I kind of think it's a waste of time myself, right? So you're not doing it because it doesn't feel like a good use of your time. Um, but if you really wanted to do it, you could figure out how to create the behavior in the way that's right for you. So your nature doesn't have to change. But again, like... I was talking about accountability. For some people, accountability is really important. So if you were somebody who was very sensitive to accountability, I would say um, invite a bunch of people over to your house and tell them that you're, they're going to they're gonna take a tour of your whole house. And you don't want them to see the mess. And so, that'll, so you could use accountability to get you. Or you could say to somebody, um, I'm going to clean this up, or I'll pay you 50 bucks. Or you know, there's a million ways to set up accountability if you know that that's what you need. Um, so you can. You can potentially change your nature, but you can also get what you want without bothering to change your nature by just changing your habits in the way that is suited to your nature as it is right now. Other questions? OK, while well, you guys are thinking, I'll ask another one. Is there a risk of like um, knowing yourself a little too well and getting like, you know, being like, I don't like parties, so I'm never going to go to a party. Like, you know, kind of limiting your experiences because you, you get kind of trapped in your identity. Right. Well, and some people say, you know, if you can find, if you define me, you can find me. And I think that that is a concern. I think sometimes you can get locked into an identity um, or sort of use it to let yourself off the hook. Um, but I think for most of us, it's, it's, it's really, I feel like it's the opposite problem. It's the not really understanding ourselves. Or, or instead of saying, like, oh, I don't like parties, it's like, is it that I don't like parties? Or is it that I don't like loudness? Or is it that I don't like more than five people? Or I feel, I feel uncomfortable talking to strangers? Or um, I'm, you know, like, to really understand what's going on, really to know yourself and your, it, that will often suggest solu solutions. Um, I had a friend who was, like, ready to quit her job. She's a lawyer in Washington, D.C. This was a while ago. This was a long time ago. Um, and she, she was like, I hate it. I got I to gotta switch careers. But then she realized that actually what she hated was her commute. She had a terrible commute in from Virginia every day. It was, you know, it was relentless. So she started listening to audiobooks. And this completely transformed her commute. And then she said she actually caught herself sitting in the, her car in her driveway to listen longer one day because she was listening to some great book. So here's a person who was ready to switch careers when her actual problem was that she had a bad commute. So if you don't identify the problem and understand, like, okay, how, what am I bringing to this? Like, because if somebody said, oh, I want to uh, switch careers, or oh, I feel burned out. Why do you feel burned out? Do you feel burned out because you're lonely? Do you feel burned out because you're doing the work of three people? Are you, doing bur are you burned out because you're 
um, having to supervise two kids on Zoom? Are you feeling burned out because you never make time for exercise? Are you feeling burned out because you don't have a romantic relationship that satisfies you? Because you don't have a dog. I mean, there's so many reasons that people might be feeling burned out. And if we don't say, okay, what's true for me? What's actually going on here? Well, then we might not find the right answers for ourselves or the right way to think about what we could change to bring about more happiness. Yeah. Well, it looks like we're going to have to leave it there. Um, but thank you so much, Gretchen. Thank you, thank Olga. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> And now, please enjoy a first look at the Harvard edX and Arthur C. Brooks online course about managing happiness. You may be familiar with words such as introverted and extroverted, or outgoing and reserved, as popular terms that people use to categorize and describe themselves. The PANIS profile is different, but similarly helpful for us to understand ourselves when it comes to the good and bad moods, which we also call positive affect and negative affect, that dominate our lives. You might think that if you have high negative affect, it means that you must have low positive affect, that they're opposites. This isn't true, however. More positive affect does not equate to less negative affect. Both can be present at the same time, or neither depending on your unique character. I came up with four profiles to help us understand this idea. If you tend to express a lot of positive affect, but express little negative affect, you'd fall into the cheerleader category. Lots of good moods, not too many bad moods. If, on the other hand, you tend to show high negative affect and low positive affect, you fall into the poet category. Lots of bad moods fewer good moods. If you're high on both, I'll call you a mad scientist. You have lots of strong emotions, good and bad. And if you are low on both, you're a judge. You don't get lots of strong moods on either side. You're really steady. None of these profiles are good or bad. They are just who you are. In fact, no matter where you sit, there's a role in life for which you are ideally suited. Remember, we need poets and judges, not just cheerleaders and mad scientists. Most of our emotions stem from a region deep in the brain called the limbic system, where we process stimuli automatically. The limbic system sends signals to the front part of our brain called the prefrontal cortex, the part where we process conscious thought, where we process our feelings and figure out how to express positive or negative emotions. The right side of our prefrontal cortex is more active when we process unhappiness, and the left side is more active when we are processing happiness. A classic error is thinking that by merely lowering the sources of negative feelings, we will increase positive feelings. But remember, you can be high or low in both we have to learn to separate positive and negative emotions to devise a strategy that raises our net well-being. Once we understand our personal PANIS profile and how negative and positive emotions originate, we can begin making progress in modifying our behavior for the goals and outcomes we want to achieve. Equal to a lack of happiness is essential and can help us to rethink the phenomena in our everyday lives. If we want more total well-being, we need to ask the right question. Is my issue a lack of happiness or an excess of unhappiness? From our happiness portfolio, we have four principal sources of happiness. Faith, family, friends, and work, which includes earned success and service to others. Unhappiness can be something like mental illness or barriers that keep us from pursuing happiness. However, these distinctions are not always obvious. Economists came up with a way to distinguish between sources of happiness and unhappiness in everyday life called the Day Reconstruction Method. In 2004, Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman asked participants in a study to write a short diary of their previous day and think of events like short episodes in their day. Then, participants answered a series of questions that ranked these episodes into scales of positive and negative affect. 
Some results were unsurprising, such as socializing being high on the positive scale. However, some results were unexpected, such as time spent interacting with one's boss ranking as one of the most negative events in a person's day. Researchers also found that negative affect tended to fluctuate throughout the day, being highest in the morning, going down during lunch, back up in the afternoon, and lowest at night. For our next session to discuss how helping others makes us happier, please welcome Dacker Keltner, professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and faculty director at the Greater Good Science Center, and Emiliana Simon-Thomas, the science director of the Greater Good Science Center. Thank you. So good to be with you. Uh, I'm Dacker, uh, up at UC Berkeley, and 20 years ago, um, we were approached by a couple of Cal alumni who had lost a daughter very early in life and had heard about the science of happiness that you're learning about here uh, and uh, wanted to create something that really brought well-being to as many people as possible. So uh, Emiliana and I are going to give you a sampling of how we approach the topic of happiness, the pursuit of happiness. And I'd really like to draw your attention to uh, sort of a philosophy of how we approach this, which is to ground things in science, as Arthur uh, just did with his edX course, to think about neuroscience, um, to think about practices, right? Um, you know, cultures for millennia have really been thinking about how do we build strong communities uh, and strong relationships and, and the like. And so to think about actionable knowledge, which is unusual for academics very often, and then to disseminate. And so our center is doing a lot of good work in thousands of schools, in healthcare settings, in organizational settings. Uh, and so just be thinking about as we work through today uh, the pursuit of happiness from the greater good perspective about the deep science, the actionable knowledge, and where you put it into play. Uh, and uh, Emilia and I, Emiliana and I will focus on the topic of helping. Yeah, I was so, well, number one, delighted to be here. Thank you for joining us. and. Um, being so interested in this topic. Uh, Dacher and I launched a Science of Happiness course on edX in 2015, and I just looked up the numbers this morning, and um, 950,538 people have enrolled over the last seven years. And we're both humbled and inspired by that. People really want to understand what it is they can do in their lives to be more acquainted with what brings them happiness, and again, we're, we're after this at the Greater Good Science Center. One of the other things that Dacker does that he didn't mention is he hosts the Science of Happiness podcast. So if you are somebody who enjoys consuming information in that way, um, it's really a wonderful um, sequence of conversations with people who try an exercise or an activity in their daily life and then a conversation with the research scientist who actually showed or demonstrated that this particular exercise works. Um, so it, it's so wonderful to be here, and I'm so honored to be invited to share what we do. Um, I wanted to start by just putting some data behind what we've been hearing for the past several days, which is that loneliness is a huge disservice to our well-being, and social connection and relationships are foundational to our well-being. Um, this is a paper from two years ago that, that looked across the animal kingdom at what degree of sociability um, each different kind of species was. And uh, the image is really meant to taking into consideration strong and weak social bonds, taking into consideration uh, whether there's hierarchy or power and status differentials, and whether people or organisms have suffered from um, adverse childhood experiences or been lucky enough to have a warm and comforting and safe childhood, what is the relationship? What is the relationship between social connection and longevity? And the little chart with the red and blue dots really shows you that people who have more social connection, people who are integrated socially. That means that you have others that you can count on and people who count on you and that you're able to secure resources as a function of those relationships. People who have that, they live longer, they live healthier, they live happier lives. So, um, 
As Vivek Murthy uh, suggested, this is a, a, a challenge of our times, loneliness. You know, 43% of people over the age of 65 feel lonely. They don't have enough social connection. And one of the strongest animators of strong social ties is this emotion Emiliana and I have been studying and teaching about, which is compassion, the feeling of concern for the welfare of others and the desire to help other people lift up their lives. Um, in Born to be Good, when I did the, the scholarship behind this, what you find is a lot of skepticism about the place of compassion in human social life from people like Sigmund Freud, who did not have it in his framework of the human mind to libertarian Ayn Rand. The morality of altruism is what men have to reject to Machiavelli and others. We've had a skepticism about compassion, despite the fact that in the world's great spiritual ethical traditions, that is one of the common cores to the good life, as Karen Armstrong has argued. Um, interestingly, Charles Darwin did not have this view of human nature. He was a devoted father of 10, watched his young daughter die of what was probably tuberculosis, came to the conclusion that sympathy, kindness, compassion is our strongest instinct. For communities to survive and raise the greatest number of offspring, we have to cultivate compassion. Um, it is uh, just a basic fact about evolution that our offspring are the most vulnerable of any mammal uh, that's in, in the history of life. This is a picture of a little chimpanzee baby. I'm going to count to three. I want to hear the sound from your voice. There we, you, you failed. You didn't, I didn't, you're supposed to wait till three. But one, two, three. Aww. Nice. That actually is a deep evolutionary sound that's millions of years old of when we see things that we care for. Uh, this chimpanzee baby will be doing things very unusual for humans in a year or so. It'll be on its own, feeding itself, taking care of itself. Our human babies take eight to 52 years to reach the age of independence. <laughs> if ever. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so compassion is built into our human nervous system and our bodies. It is a deep evolutionary prerogative. So I'm going to walk you through our first exercise. I hate to tell you, we're going to have you do a very embarrassing things through the course of our 20 more minutes. Um, this is a, a practice of compassion or kindness. Um, you're trying different things that come out of what we call intervention science, how to build this stuff into hospitals and schools and organizations. I'll talk about an, the benefits of this and after. Emiliana will talk about the neuroscience. So what I'd like you to do is just sit upright and rest your hands on your knees. Close your eyes. It's going to take about a minute. Um, take a nice deep breath in, expanding your chest and your belly. And as you breathe out, pull in your abdominal muscles and push the air through your throat and your nose. Breathing in, expand the chest and your belly. Start to feel your body sense a little bit different thing. And breathing out. Now as you breathe in, call to mind a person or a dog, not a cat, who you feel kindly towards that you care for. As you breathe out, call to mind that person's eyes and their face, maybe their voice. And now I'm going to say some phrases and just orient these words towards that person. Breathing in, may you be filled with loving kindness. On our next breath together, may you be safe from inner and outer dangers. Our next breath, may you be well in body and mind. Finally, 
May you be at ease and happy. On this last breath together, just notice what went through your mind and how your body feels. A little bit of loving kindness. And let's open our eyes. Um, that simple practice, a couple of minutes, right? We took about a minute. Uh, helps software engineers over the course of eight weeks find greater happiness, cardiovascular patients really struggling with that condition, better health profile, lots of benefits throughout the intervention science literature. Uh, and what's remarkable, simple practices like that change your neurophysiology. So on the last slide, uh, we called it tapping into prosociality. And prosociality is essentially a sort of fancy word for how we feel when we're inclined towards serving the welfare of others, when we have that urge to invest in another person's feeling joyful or amused, when we can make someone laugh, or when we can really relieve their pain or suffering if they're going through a difficult time. If this is um, something that we can argue is fundamental or core or just an a, 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 a innate motivation for humans, we scientists want to find biological underpinnings and correlates. We want to find systems in the body and the brain that are associated with these behaviors or that if they're missing, somehow these behaviors or these experiences don't occur. And there are many. I'm going to talk to you about three really briefly. Oxytocin is this neuropeptide that humans amongst mammals create or manufacture and utilize most robustly, right? And what it does when it gets released into our bloodstream is it makes us feel trusting of each other. It inclines us towards generosity and cooperation and benevolence. It, it makes us feel like we want to protect each other. Um, the vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. This is the little figure with the brain and all the uh, sort of wires going out to different parts of the body. Vagus nerve comes out of the brainstem and goes all over, goes to a lot of different physiological systems. But researchers have discovered that if we look at what it does to the heart, how it affects uh, our, our respiration, how our, our rate of heartbeat, uh, as a function of what it looks like when we inhale versus exhale, this is predictive of, number one, happiness, but number two, our affiliative nature, the extent to which we want to approach and engage with others in benevolent and generous ways. Third, there are systems and pathways in the brain that are dedicated to nurturance, to caring for offspring, to being cared for as a child of parents. These systems are supporting those kinds of experiences, and they get repurposed throughout the life course to drive us to enter into long-term, mutually benevolent social bonds. So, And these are deep in the brain. They're not higher order cognitive structures that come online and get st strengthened over the course of our lives. We're, we're built with them, our innate, um, tendency and predilection is, is to act in accordance with them. A second way that we look at our connection, our tendency to interact with one another is by observing what happens when people are together. And this chart from Ruth Feldman maps out the ways that our physiological and behavioral systems synchronize. We mirror one another. It's true. If you walk into a room of people hysterically laughing, you will feel the urge to laugh also even though you don't know what the joke was, right? We synchronize, we mirror our nervous systems, attune with one another. If you're having a close, meaningful, uh, emotionally rich conversation with someone, your heart rate and your physiological profile will start to look more like theirs. It will go in phase with theirs. Researchers have also looked at brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. When you bring people into fMRI scanners and you have them do a cooperative task, those who are more successful at that teamwork are showing greater brain-to-brain -brain synchrony. So, I want to give you a chance to practice this, to exercise this. Um, for this, you'll have a partner. Um, so turn to the person next to you. If you have to be three, that's OK, too. Just um, for the first 30 seconds, uh, uh, what I would like one person to do is volunteer to be the uh, mover and the other person to be the follower. And really, it's quite simple. The first 30-second uh, interval, the mover is going to go through a sequence. You're going to look at each other. 
face each other. You're gonna go through a sequence of really robust, exaggerated facial expressions. If you're wearing a mask, you make greater use of your eyebrows and your eyes. You don't have to take it off if that's uncomfortable. So the, the follower is gonna mimic. Just do exactly in real time the same facial musculature that you see the other person doing. <laughs> We should do it. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> okay, great. Your 30 seconds is up. Now we're going to switch roles. So whoever was the mover, become the follower. And this time, stand up. Stand up from your seats if you can. And now the mover is going to do hand gestures, some kind of like French mime, Parisian mime, or gesticulations. And 30 seconds, follow each other as closely in real time as you can. Exercise those mirroring muscles. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Please thank your partner. Woo! Give yourself Great a round job. of applause. Yeah, let's all clap. <laughs> Lastly, I just want to give you a little bit more evidence for how central and foundational our urge towards kindness and generosity and cooperation is. When researchers look at infants, they'll show them little puppets. One puppet or even a like cartoon figure will be kind and helpful and generous. The other one will be sort of self-interested and competitive and hostile. And they, you, know, you can't ask babies, what do you like more, right? You just measure what they look at. What do they, where does their gaze go? And babies, bar none, like to look at the kind and friendly figures and puppets much more than the hostile ones. So there's this attraction and an appeal of generous and kindness, generosity and kindness from, from as early as we can measure. Um, when we ask people, uh, give people a chance to either share in a fair way or be self-interested. So imagine I give you $10 and say you're going to split it with somebody you'll never meet, you'll never see. How are you going to split it? You could say I'm going to take $9.99 and give them one cent. That would be the most rational, economically uh, uh, smart thing to do. Nobody does that. People share evenly and fairly. We are exquisitely attuned to fairness, and that is because we are an ultra-social species. That has to be there in order for us to coordinate effort, in order for us to achieve what we can as a collective in community. And then lastly, our reward circuits, the same pathways that motivate us to seek uh, pleasurable experiences, they also come online when we act charitably. Researchers put people into a scanner and told them they have to give away half of their winnings. Right? You have to give it away. It's sort of, it was called mandatory taxation. This was a collaboration between neuroscientists and economists. And the economists were really like surprised at the end of the study because they thought people were going to be pissed, thought, oh, this is going to be amygdala activation, that structure in the brain that signals salience and distress. And what they found was that there was reward activation. People actually had a warm glow, an opening in their chest, a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction when they were given that opportunity to give away their earnings to serve the welfare of others. So we're built for this, and we prefer it. It's our prepotent response. So uh, when Emiliana and I teach the science of happiness, and by the way, one of the great joys is to watch you guys do that mirroring exercise, and some of you break out the funky chicken, and <laughs> saw some weird yoga stuff going on over here. Here we go, man, watch this one. You know, so good work. Um, but these are really tools of prosociality that are old in our evolutionary history, empathy, compassion, gratitude, and giving. Uh, all of these processes activate, as Emiliana said, the reward circuitry in your brain. So that's why you feel the warm glow of being kind and generous. And so the last one that I want to talk about is an ancient one, which is gratitude. Um, gratitude in our lab, we've really studied it with respect to, you can go to the next slide, touch. Um, this is one of our tactile contact with each other, deprived during the pandemic is one of the oldest languages of social connection. Next slide, please. 
This graph shows just the parent-child connection, but it's true of every social interaction. When we make physical contact with each other, we use this incredible tool of evolution, a five-digit wonder called the human hand. Our skin is billions of cells. We have cells of our immune system that are embedded in our skin. It sends signals up to your brain, synchronizes people into uh, goodwill very often. So we're gonna do our final exercise, perhaps the strangest. Remember, you're in Northern California after all. Uh, <laughs> and this actually mirrors a study that we did in my lab um, uh, that has uh, replicated in different countries. I study the touch of NBA basketball teams and friends and you know, young brothers, roughhousing. It's just a universal language of kindness, giving, and connection. But here's a, a laboratory version of it that you'll do right now. We're gonna break into two. One of you will be the touch E, and you'll stick out your arm, close your eyes, and then the other person is the toucher, and they have to choose these to try to communicate just with a little touch, three emotions, love, sympathy, and gratitude. Touch in any order that you want, that once you're touched as the touch E, try to guess what emotion just happened and we'll see how well you do. A touchy and a toucher, go. stop. I said stop. Ding. <laughs> All right. I see some relationships forming. <laughs> Perhaps a marriage proposal later in the day, looking at the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so how many of you got, say, two right? Three? Amazing, right? Way above chance. Uh, replicated in different countries. I will tell you, we have these interesting gender differences. We had all co gender combinations in our study. When the um, man tries to communicate compassion to a female arm, she's like, I don't know what that was. <laughs> and then regrettably, when the woman tried to, this is a fuller study, tried to communicate anger to the male arm, he was like, was that a joke? You know, so. <laughs> but that's the human condition. So um, as Adam Smith, the great economist, before he wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776, a landmark book on the nature of economies and markets, he wrote a theory of moral sentiments, 1759, I think. And he said the duties of gratitude are the most sacred of those which the beneficent virtues prescribe to us. So Smith really felt, like a lot of people, and Darwin, that we are endowed, as Emiliana said, in human nature with virtue, and we have to cultivate them. This is very true of gratitude, our final tool of kindness and giving, um, and just feeling reverence for the things that are given to us. These are just some studies of this vast um, gratitude literature. If you express gratitude to people in a social network, uh, you have stronger social networks over the course of time, Sarah Aljo. Uh, Adam Grant, Francesca Gino, Harvard and uh, Wharton, Adam, of course, the great uh, organizational psychologist you may have read. When you say, as a leader or manager, as you, if you say thank you, people are more likely to work with good spirit, right? Just expressing appreciation. Our labs found, Amy Gordon, uh, when we express gratitude in casual conversation to our romantic partners, we stay together. We're more likely to stay together. It is the fabric of healthy societies. Um, 
So closing. Yeah, I mean, I'll say one tiny thing about gratitude because it's one of my favorite uh, topics, which is that if you want to get better at practicing gratitude, one of your best strategies is to say it more often, but say it in a way that includes three elements. One is what the other person did. Just when you don't just say, hey, thanks, man, that was great. Thank them exactly for what they did. Acknowledge the effort that they put in. You know, they could have been doing a billion other things, but they did what they did, and it served you. And then describe how it served you. Describe the impact. If you do those three things, your experience of warmth and connection is magnified, as is their sense of appreciation and connection and idea that you're a worthwhile partner to interact with and engage with in the future. So what Dacker and I really wanted to share with you today was a tiny morsel of what we teach about the science of happiness and to, and to really bring home the point that it's malleable, that a lot of your own day-to-day -day experience of happiness has to do with how you prioritize your time and your effort and your energy. If you're involved in that and you're choosing things that are meaningful, that are about investing in relationships, you're likely to amplify your your happiness curve in the way that Arthur Brooks has been talking about, as opposed to investing in material possessions and the kinds of uh, advantages and status building uh, exercises that we often feel like are the most important thing. Those things help for a little while, but then they, their impact uh, sort of shuts down. And the second is really simple. You know, when we come out of the pandemic, 25% rise in depression worldwide, a recent publication, Vivek Murthy, reorienting American healthcare to these issues, kindness really matters. It is good for life expectancy, your heart, your organization, your mind, your kids, your neighbors. Uh, it is a good principle to stick with. And helping other people is actually way more available to us than we think. Uh, Daryl Cameron is this researcher who studies why people like choose not to help, and it's often this erroneous calculation that it's gonna be really costly and that there's no benefit, when in fact that's just not what happens. It's not costly. We reap a great benefit relate in terms of our relationship and our communities from being helpful and our own, again, sense of worth, meaning, and purpose, and overall happiness in life. So. Thank you. It's so nice to get to present and talk with you. And now for a session produced by our underwriter, the John Templeton Foundation. There are a lot of big mysteries that get us up in the morning. What's the origin of the universe? There was, after all, the Big Bang. But what created the Big Bang? Where does time start? Where does it go? Where is the data? What do we know now? How come there is matter in the universe? How is technology changing who we are? What is character development? Is it possible to teach humility? If it was a God who cared about human beings, what was that God like? How do we enhance who we are individually and societally? I mean, the purpose of man is a huge question. What is the very nature of human love? How do we love each other better? These are some of the deep questions that we're trying to figure out. We want to understand not just how we came to be here, we want to understand, is there some meaning? Is there some purpose? What should we be doing with our time? If you don't understand what the end of a human being is, what is the purpose of a human being, then you're not going to have a civilization that helps people to thrive humanly. We have a continuing fascination and excitement with the natural world, with this ability that we have, which is a wonderful ability, to look up there, to look down into the very small, and to learn continually about the wonderful things they are hidden from us as we unveil more and more of the natural world. Such magic out in the forest, and it just is a feeling of spirituality. You know, it's something so powerful and so much beyond what even the most scientific, brilliant brain could have created. These amazingly beautiful things that are hiding just under the surface that science can uncover, whether it's a, a differential equation or some elegant biochemical uh, structure, that's awe-inspiring, that's beautiful. That lifts you up out of the mundane nature 
of what we might have thought looking at that structure before we had science to reveal it. There's a quality of the world that unites us all together, which is the, the urge that we all have to understand the world, the urge that we all have to see whether that understanding can enrich our lives. Everybody cares about that. And now for a wellness moment with Arthur C. Brooks. This is called the chipping away exercise. Step one, make a list of all the ways that you wish you were different. Think about it and be honest. Do you wish you were thinner? or richer, or funnier, or more successful, or cooler, or more admired. Make a list of all the ways that you think you'd be better off if you were different. Now, here's step two. Look at each item on the list and ask yourself two questions. Why do you want each one of these things? For example, you want to be thinner. Why? So you can be more attractive. So you can find a partner so that other people might love you more. Why do you want to be more successful? More successful than what? Well, obviously more successful than others. Why? Do you want to make other people feel envious? Is the jealousy of others something you're looking for? Be honest. Why do you want each one of these things? Then ask yourself, do you like these motives? Are you proud of these motives? If you're really, really honest and you've written them down, you proud of them? Okay, here's step three. Imagine you had all these things on your list. How would they really be changing your life? Be completely honest. How much happier would you be? This requires that you connect it to what you assumed would bring you happiness. Now here's step four. You know perfectly that all the things on your list that you'd like to change about yourself would require resources. It would require effort and time and money and energy and it would probably mean changing your relationships and all kinds of stuff like that. So ask yourself this. What would you be willing to give up to get these things from your life? For example, would you be willing to give up relationships with loved ones in order to do the work that you need to do to make a lot more money? Would you be willing to spend the money you'd need to spend in order to do the things to change your appearance that would be required? Is it worth it? Here's step five. Think about who you really are. Think about the person you are that's not defined by all these worldly desires because the things that you put on your list probably are just accoutrements. They're just details, they're extras to make you somehow better than the real you. Here's step six. Think about chipping away these added parts, these inauthentic parts of yourself. Now, don't chip away the things that you want to actually make you more like you, uh, I should say, a better version of yourself. Simply chip away the attachments to the desires of the things that would make you a little bit different than yourself because you're uncomfortable with who you are. Now think about that list. Think about the list of the money and the stuff and the, and the image and all that. And one by one by one, look at that list and declare your independence from each one of those things. Here's step seven, this is the last step. Do this every day for a week and keep track of how it makes you feel right after you do it and how it makes you act the next day. This is gonna change you. This is gonna make you more authentic and I dare say, it's gonna make you happier. While we're on a break, we encourage you to network with other attendees and visit our expo booths. Participate, select the networking icon located on the left-hand side of the screen. Next, click join, and you'll be randomly paired with another attendee for about five minutes. If you wish, you can exchange virtual information with each other.
Click the Explore icon to visit our virtual expo booths. Here you can explore more resources from the Atlantic and our underwriters related to today's event. We'll see you shortly after the break.